This is an Inkbird CO2 controller. Now I reckon you can use this device here to grow mushrooms like this here. Traditionally people use uh, small humidity controllers which Inkbird also make to um, grow mushrooms. But I think you might be able to have just as much success growing mushrooms with a CO2 controller like this one here. Why? Because when people often grow mushrooms in let's say shotgun fruiting chambers, they often run into the problem of not having enough fresh air exchange. Now this should alleviate the problem of having enough fresh air exchange. Humidity is fairly easy to get. It's the fresh air that people often get wrong. So what we're gonna to do today is try and grow mushrooms with this device. We'll do a wee unboxing and see what this looks like. So we have the manual, and here is the controller. Now that looks pretty standard for an Inkbird style controller. I'm sure you've all seen them. Now in here, we should have a CO2 meter. Here we go. So this is what we're going to use to read the CO2 levels uh, in our homemade fruiting chamber. The measurement range on this is 0 to 10,000 ppm and it says its accuracy is down to about 30 ppm so that's um, fairly good and um, you can't complain about that. So to make this we just need a few things. The first thing we're going to use is a very large container like this. This is a very, uh, 90 litre Sistema container. This is actually made in New Zealand. Good old New Zealand. We're also going to use perlite, which I have just sitting down there. Now perlite has a high surface area. Now the reason we're going to use perlite is we put a layer in the bottom and we soak it with water. And that creates an area that can create humidity in the atmosphere in here. We're also going to use a wee fan. I love using fans. This is a tiny, it's a 24 volt fan I think, but that goes really slowly. So what we're gonna do is cut a hole in the side, affix that fan in there, then we're going to put our Inkbird controller in here, and that's going to control the fan. So when the CO2 level in here raises too high or gets too high, it turns the fan on and it sucks that CO2 out. On the other side, there'll be a few holes drilled just above the perlite where fresh air can move it. So this is going to create an environment where the minute it gets above a certain level of CO2, the fan turns on and pulls that CO2 out and the perlite along the bottom is going to act as the medium to humidify it. Inside this container, we will cut a block, cut a hole in it so the mushrooms can fruit from it, and place it inside. And I reckon in about one week, we'll have mushrooms. So we've got a little split in there, but that's okay. I've tried drilling this plastic before and it's always real challenging to not split it, but that's fine. So we've poured some perlite into the bottom of our container here. Now this is going to act as the medium which holds onto the moisture and allows this chamber to humidify. Mushrooms need humidification, so it's very important. Now when you're handling uh, perlite, it helps just to wear a mask. It puts out a lot of dust, and that dust isn't very good for your lungs. So we'll throw our mask on. And then we've just got a jug of water here, and we're just gonna really give this perlite a good soaking. We just mix it up. It can hold a lot of water, perlite. Now that it's all wet, the water actually acts as a dust suppressant, so you don't really need the mask anymore. Now when I push the perlite aside, I can only just see water sort of starting to pool in the bottom. So now that we have our wet perlite in here, we know roughly the level that we want to cut the ear holes on. Now we want to cut them nice and low to the perlite, so when the ear comes in, it um, helps pick up some of the moisture off that perlite. You need holes just big enough so that this fan here, when it's pumping air out, the path of least resistance for the ear to get in is through these holes, and not ideally around the uh, rim of the lid here. We will put a small weight on the lid to hold it down. There will be a slight bit of air ingress um, um, through here, we're not going to seal it, but we've got most of the air coming in along these holes. So I've got a holes all cut along here. Doesn't need to be too accurate, I'm not too concerned. If you're really tidy, you might draw a line and get them all, all even, but... And we're going to push that perlite right up underneath the holes. 
So when the air moves in, it's got a lot of that perlite there for it to move over. So this here is the CO2 probe uh, component for the uh, Inkbird controller. And I'm just going to mount that about halfway down on the wall on the inside, of course. We've got a little hook here. Um, so we'll just mount that just so it sort of hangs on the wall. Now one final part is the cable. We actually need the cable to come out. So I've got a slightly larger drill bit. And then we'll just drill a hole um, underneath here and we'll poke that cable right out through it and it'll keep it very tidy. And that comes out there like so. And we could even put a wee bit of tape over that there just to hold it in place. So it's on, it's working. Hopefully you can see that. Say it's 449 um, ppm of CO2 it's reading inside the box here. And um, there's this plug here which says work one and work two. Work, work one is if you're using a um, CO2 generator. So when that value drops below it will generate CO2. And work two is for an extraction fan. So when it's above that it will extract CO2. We are only going to be using work two because we want to keep our CO2 below a specific point for mushroom growing. So to set this all we're going to do is hold the set key down for two seconds. And then we're going to have our CO2 concentration and we're going to tone that right down. And for this experiment we'll use 600 ppm. Set. This is the work one difference which we're going to ignore because we're not going to be using the work one plug. And this is the work two difference. And we want this down to about 50. So once it hits 650 it's going to turn that extraction fan on and wind the CO2 back down to 6. 100. Hold it down for two seconds and we are good. Now you'll notice the work one lights on. This is because it's trying to increase the CO2 in that room. We, we can ignore that. That means that work one plug is actually live. We want the work two plug on to decrease the CO2. So this is what we're going to place in here. Now this is a pink oyster mushroom block. Um, this has had a hole cut in the face which I have just cut in it. And this is ready to go on here and start fruiting. The brock's probably sort of three or four days past its prime for fruiting, but that's okay. You can see it's really trying to grow some wee mushrooms on the top here. We'll just ignore those, and it will still grow a nice big patch of mushrooms out the face here. So all we need to do is move this block into here. Like so. Cover it up. And now we wait for about a week for mushrooms to grow. Why do we need to vacate the CO2 out of here? Well that mushroom block there actually creates CO2 as it's digesting the wood. The mycelium here eats the wood and grows mushrooms from it. So it's digesting the wood and it's releasing all that carbon that that wood locked up when the tree originally grew. Now mushrooms don't like the CO2, they really don't like it at all. They grow long and leggy, tall and spindly when there's a lot of CO2. So we're just making sure we get that CO2 out to provide that mushroom with a great environment to thrive in. So now we put it in the corner and we wait. We're on day three team and check this out. We have got a really fantastic pin set which is growing into some really good mushrooms here. If we get this block out, have a look at that eh? Have a look at that. That is a good set of pink oysters growing out of this block. Well, I'm really, really happy with that. So we're going to give this another couple of days. Um, I think about two, two days this will be ready, two and a bit, maybe three days this will be ready to go. It's growing really quickly because we've had some really hot weather here. Um, I've walked in and I've got this little temperature gauge here, which is also a CO2 meter, and this has been hitting 30, I saw this 30 on a couple of days. And then last night we had a pile of rain come in. So it's actually really warm and humid right here now. We're usually not that humid. But I have been spraying it with water, just squirting the walls down a little bit. Um, it's probably not needed today because it's uh, so wet outside. Um, but the days prior to that, uh, yeah, it was really hot. Um, so the pink oysters do actually like a bit of heat and they don't seem to be bothered by that really hot temperature, which is really good. So we'll give these another uh, two or three days and then we'll see just how good a flush of mushrooms we can get off this. Oh look at that, that's really something isn't it? That's really something. Oh team, check these out. 
Now I think we're on day seven of this wee adventure and look at this bunch of pinks. Now that you cannot complain about, right? That has got a really nice bunch of pinks just hanging off the front there. Um, perfect time to harvest. A little bit of perlite stuck on the bottom, but we're not complaining about that. Um, they've grown exceptionally well, I think. Um, this has done, um, done its job, to be honest. Um, but I will let you know a wee secret. I have been spraying it quite a bit with this here, um, especially the last uh, day or so. We had a good bout in the middle there where it was really wet outside um, and the, everything got quite humid. Um, and I think that helped them grow very well. But otherwise, I haven't had to spray quite a lot just because it was so hot here, it's so dry and in summer. But they've grown perfectly. Um, the CO2 meter works a charm. That fan just goes on and off, on and off as needed. We've got our second CO2 meter in there. That's mainly, um, I was watching the humidity on that. So it's 84% humidity right now, 83.84. .84. So it's been sitting about 85% humidity in here. That can drop down a little bit, and I've always been trying to keep it above 80 just with the wet wool. But other than that, yeah, that's a great bunch of mushrooms, right? Like if you're growing pinks like that, you're growing some pretty good pinks. Um, the main, like to grow good mushrooms, I find one of the main key points you need to understand is that culture matters um, and having a reliable uh, culture that grows good quality mushrooms is where you want to start from. If you have a culture which um, grows poor quality mushrooms um, and you're trying to improve the quality of those mushrooms with substrate or atmospheric conditions, you're just not really going to get anywhere. Um, it's like the old saying is it's fruit from the poison tree or fruit from the poison seed or fruit from the poison roots. There's an old saying anyway, but yeah, so you've got to start with a good culture um, and grow from that there. Um, and that gives you a little bit more leniency in the conditions if the culture is a really uh, good performer. Our Italian oyster culture is a really good performer and we haven't actually found a better performer than it. We've, we've imported commercial strains from overseas and all sorts to try and beat our strain here and none of them compare. So um, that is one uh, key takeaway from this. Uh, the ink bird here uh, uh, worked flawlessly. What you expect it to do, right, just sit there and just do its job, to be honest. Um, so that was great. It's good to have one of these. I'm probably now going to um, fit this um, in uh, maybe just inside my incubation room. Um, and just to get PPM readings from inside that incubation room, um, just in case I don't want the PPMs getting to like toxic levels in there, right? Um, just, it's more of a, it probably won't control any fans or anything, but just so I can walk and glance at the CO2 levels in there. But for now, we'll probably wrap this up and probably harvest these mushrooms. Um, probably put them on the dinner plate, to be honest. Hey guys, before we end the video, I'll just show you something quite interesting. I actually left these mushrooms in here for another day. And as they've gotten bigger and bigger, they've really started to drop a whole lot of spores. Now the spores did clog up our wee tiny fan here. And the alarm on the ink bird is going off. And that alarm's going off because the CO2 reading is far too high. It's reading five and a half thousand on the on that CO2 meter, and on the one in here it's reading four thousand eight hundred. Um, so, yeah, the fan's actually gotten a bit warm as well. But there's the mushrooms there. You can see they're just really overgrowing, right? And and. I'd say the, the, the spores would have been sort of starting to build up on that fan. I didn't really actually check to have a look, but I'd say the spores were building up on that fan for um, as it was maturing, and now as it's really maturing, um, they've just dropped a heck of a lot, and it's just clogged that fan to pieces. Well, there we go. That's just turned off now that I've had the lid off, so it's coming back with an intolerance now. So maybe a bigger fan might be beneficial. You could probably get this one going, There we go, so with a quick um, flick of that fan there, just to sort of break away some of those spores, it was able to uh, start running again. If anything, this is the perfect example of just how much spore uh, gets released from some mushroom species, and exactly why we wear these when we're in uh, the mushroom fruiting chambers. I get a lot of questions on my YouTube asking why I'm wearing uh, respirators when I'm inside, and um, the reason is because if those spores weren't on those fans, and if I didn't have that mask on, there's a good chance they'd be in my lungs, and probably not good for your lungs.